Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the Sewist and Quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Today, we're celebrating So and So's 70th episode by traveling across the pond to meet Philip and Naylor, Sewist, Quilter, textile artist, author, and teacher. Born in Yorkshire, England, Philip had discovered a love of sewing and knitting as a child. Receiving a secondhand sewing machine for her 13th birthday enabled her to progress from making doll clothes to full-size garments for herself, family, and friends. She trained as a clothing designer, then worked for five years designing lingerie for Courtauld's Clothing. After this, she moved to Dharan, Saudi Arabia with her husband, Peter, where she set up a business making bespoke wedding and evening dresses and had two sons, Daniel and Benjamin. In 1996, while in Saudi Arabia, Philippa took a quilting course after which quilting became an all-consuming passion. Philippa has had great success in quilt shows in both the UK and America, winning myriad awards. She's also made miniature quilts which are less than 12 inch square in size, and they have proven to be especially successful in shows, winning several first place awards, best of show, and most notably, the Paducah Best Miniature Quilt Award three years running. She's a book author, teaches classes online, and Philippa makes her home in Yorkshire, England, which is about 200 miles north of London. She lives there with her husband, 18 to 20 hens, and as she said, right now, only three ducks. In her spare time, she loves to garden, and you can see photos of her gardening skills on her website. Philippa, welcome to So and So. Well, thank you, Meg. It's an absolute delight to be with you today. And uh, you make me sound like I've uh, led a very full life. So I hope I've got plenty of time to do lots more exciting things. And I'd just like to also thank all the listeners for um, allowing me into their homes and cars and wherever they happen to be listening. It's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. You know, we, you and I talked before I, I hit record and, and and you are sitting in Yorkshire with your cup of tea and I'm sitting here in the States with my cup of coffee and our listeners are joining us around the table for this conversation. And uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, you, you didn't start to sew until you were about 13 when you received a secondhand sewing machine. So why this particular gift and who taught you how to sew? Okay, so I did receive a um, sewing machine for, I think, my 13th birthday, but I had been hand sewing for a long time before then. Um, And so um, back in the 60s, when I was a child, people sewed and made their own clothes because clothing was expensive. And so um, we did it for reasons other than just the love of stitch in those days. And so there was always lots going on around me. My mom did sew, although she was extremely slow. And every time she started making a dress for me, it it took so long that it went straight to my sister who was four years younger than me. Mm-hmm. Um, but my grandmother knitted and another grandma embroidered. And so there was all that kind of thing happening. And so there were lots of little offcuts of fabric that I would take and make little dollies dresses for the UK equivalent of Barbie, who was not quite so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so um, I, I was really keen to to move on to more challenging things, and I would, I would, you know, just develop such a love of of stitch, but also the possibilities of what I thought I could make to wear. Um, and so the the birthday gift of the secondhand sewing machine was an absolute uh, delight to me, and I I used it endlessly. What's the name of the UK equivalent of Barbie? Uh, well, we had Cindy, who was a little blonde doll, and then we all, some will remember an, um, a, a dark-haired doll called Tressie, which when you pressed her belly button, a big ponytail came out of the back of her head. <laughs> you know, you know, we had um, Barbie dolls that did that, too, at, at one point, and um, I think little girls tended to yank on those a little too yeah. hard, <laughs> and then you could wind the hair back into the head, too. Yeah, yeah, the winding mechanism to return the hair to the head soon broke. But I do still have my Tressy doll. She is, uh, she is around. <laughs> Interesting. And do you still have the clothing that you made for her? 
Uh, I have a, a little cardi that I knitted for my teddy bear cardigan um, with my grandma when I was about nine or ten. And that, that teddy bear has been wearing that cardigan for 50 years or so. <laughs> a very durable cardigan, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you trained to be a clothing designer. Where, where did you train? Okay, so um, in the UK, um, from the age of 16 to 18 at school, you do what are called A-levels, and generally you choose three or four subjects. So you you learn them to quite an extensive level. And two of my subjects at that point were art and needlework. And I had a really fabulous needlework teacher who had actually worked um, in the 1950s for a couturier in the town where um, I went to school. And that couturier had set up in the late Victoria Victorian era and had um, dressed the Queen of Norway and various mm. other people. And so um, a lot of the skills that my, my school teacher was teaching me were skills that she had learned and that were really fabulous techniques. And so I it was my absolute favorite subject before I had this wonderful teacher. So I was doubly blessed. Um, and then I, I went to Manchester University and I studied for four years to be a clothing designer. And we studied everything. So not just design and pattern cutting and grading, but we learned how to set up a production line and how to do, um, we learned about personnel and economics. So a very kind of all-encompassing job that was um, fitting you to work in the real clothing industry and not kind of fashion in that sense. Mm -hmm. So it gave you some very practical skills. Absolutely. And then you went to work designing lingerie for Courtaults. Yes. Yeah, so um, my husband always says that's the best job I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not sure about that one. But anyway, I trained to um, design all types of clothing. So ladies wear, I did some men's tailoring and uh, all kinds of different things. And at the end of our four years, and this was in the mid 80s, Britain had a very strong clothing industry still until then. It hadn't moved offshore. And so all the uh, manufacturers would send in jobs to college and they would be pinned up on a notice board and you could um, apply to um, have an interview. And so the first job that I ever had an interview for was this particular um, job designing lingerie for Courtauld's clothing. And I um, went for the interview and they offered me my job. Uh, so they offered me the job and I just thought, well, I might as well do it for a year. Having said that, I had just spent a large amount of money on a very expensive, um, uh, what I called my interview suit that I only ever needed to wear mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just, it was just chance really. So you learned to be a sewist while at Manchester. Was designing lingerie a different thing or was it just pretty easy to do? Uh, well, we, tra we trained to do absolutely everything. And uh, what it, when you work in industry is the, in the way that I did, and we had a design room um, with six designers. We each had our own sample machinist who would make up the, um, the designs that we had created. And then they would be presented to um, the buyers who would select from them. But um, a lot of it is more about. Um, technique and the the sequence in which the garment's going to go together and the machinery that you are going to use. Um, and so having this skill in that, I mean, having sewn garments from being really quite small and having a very, even at that age, a kind of extensive um, amount of skill in that, that was extremely helpful because I could visualize the process. And so when the garments went into um, the factory, into production, you were developing the best way of putting them together at a particular price point. And, um, and I seem to do quite well at that. So you did this for five years and then you and your husband, Peter, moved to Saudi Arabia. That's, that's quite a move. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it must have been uh, an amazing experience. Would you tell us, tell us about it and what it was like for you? Yes. So um, my husband was um, uh, an English language teacher at the time and had trained in Sweden. Um, and uh, he first went out to Saudi Arabia in the late 70s um, simply because he could earn a lot of money and he thought it would be really interesting. And so he had already spent some time in Saudi um, before we got married and I went out there. Um, I, I couldn't go out as a single woman. There are single women 
out there um, as nurses and a few other things. But particularly at the time, you had to have a husband and, and women couldn't really work in that sense. Um, and so I lived on a compound um, which had about 100 fillers and it's like a walled village. And so the quality of the accommodation was nice and everything was taken care of, all the maintenance, everything. A swimming pool in the centre, a big sports centre. And I trained to be an exercise instructor and taught ex-military guys. Mm. <laughs> exercise class, yeah, that was my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you were quite restricted in that we couldn't drive. Um, every time we left the compound, we had to be covered up, so loose-fitting clothing. Um, and so what happened with the women, some women found it very difficult. Um, I was pretty confident in that I would go shopping on my own and, and didn't let it restrict me in that point. And the women who um, had a skill would put that to you. So there were piano teachers teaching the children and people set up bakeries and takeaways and things, which is why I... Um, um, trained um, to become a an exercise instructor because on my compound I had this huge sports facility and all the guys that could drive could come into the compound for the lessons that I was teaching um, in the evenings after they'd finished their work. So what I always say about it is that wherever you are in the world, you, you know, you, there are positives and negatives. And so in Saudi Arabia, um, we had money because my husband was well paid, um, but I wasn't able to go anywhere and there wasn't anything to see when I did go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then when, when I got back to the UK, we were renovating a house and we were burning through money. So we had no money. We had no time to do anything. That There were lots of places to go, but we didn't really go there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think that one of the, the things is to, I think in Saudi Arabia, there's a kind of idea that you are, this isn't real life and you're just kind of putting life on hold for the future. And, and what you have to realize is that real life is where we are right now today and we have to make the most of it and get on with it because we, well, in my opinion, we're only here once and we've got to pack it all in. <laughs> So you had your, your two children, uh, your sons, Daniel and Benjamin, while you were in Saudi Arabia. Is what, What's the experience of, of having children like over there compared to uh, in England? Is, is it different? Okay, so um, they were not actually born there. Um, Daniel, the eldest, was born during the um, first Gulf War. And although my pe uh, husband Peter had to stay at work in Saudi, all of the wives and families were sent back to the UK. And so he was born in the UK. Having had the first, our first son in the UK, we just decided it was better to have the second one in the UK. There's an issue with passports, uh, which is complicated and I won't go into. Mm -hmm. um, but so the Daniel didn't go... To to live in Saudi until he was four months, but Benjamin went at three weeks old. And so um, we did try to make sure that they maintained contact with their kind of, they knew that they were British and would come back on holidays. But I, I, I think for young children, they almost had the most idyllic kind of 1950s childhood in that sense, because they lived on a compound where um, everybody had a mum and a dad and the dad had a well-paid job. The dads went off to work in the morning or whenever. The women didn't drive, so there were few cars on the compound. So from being very tiny, like three, four years old, the, the little friend that lives around the corner, you could phone up and you could say, Benjamin's setting off now on his bike. He'll be with you in two or three minutes. And then she would phone back and say, oh, yeah, he's here. And so you couldn't possibly do that in the UK or or in the States. It, it's just not possible. And then their school, when they went to school, um, it followed the British national curriculum, but they would have only 10 or you know, 12, 13 children in each class. And the children were of lots of different nationalities. So they were very comfortable with lots of different people from a very young age. And don't perceive that as being different. That's just how life was. Mm -hmm. um, and also they were blonde. And so the Saudis absolutely adored them. <laughs> and and they're, they're both in their 30s now, an architect, uh, a scenery designer, uh, very accomplished. Uh, yeah, yeah. My husband was um, my husband was originally an art teacher, and he now he works as a sculptor, and he has um, had some amazing commissions. And so my children have just um, grown up with all this stuff being made around them. I always remember um, when we came back to the UK, and one of my sons, Daniel, would be about fourteen or so, and I went off to give a talk somewhere, and somebody said to me. What, what do you what do your sons think about having such a funky mum? And so I went home and <laughs> said, to, "I said, Dan, Dan, do you think I'm funky?" And he said, uh, "Well, you're not like all the other mums." <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, "Is that good or bad, Dan?" And he said, "It's good, mum. It's good." Um, so they 
my husband would let them use power tools at the age of three. I mean, literally, I would have oh to leave. I would have to leave the building. Um, but they're incredibly uh, competent, and um, they they can see all the possibilities. They they're very creative and very accomplished. I, I you can tell I'm extremely proud of them. I can. Now, now, in, in addition to everything else you were doing while in Saudi Arabia, you set up a business making bespoke wedding and evening dresses. Um, tell us about that. How did that go? So, um, funny enough, I met another designer who had done a very similar course to me, but in London. And so she had d- done the very similar training. And so, of course, we immediately got on and um, we thought that we could make evening and dressing, uh, wedding dresses for expatriates. So not for the Saudis. Mm-hmm. Um, this, uh, there are Certainly at the time, there were no female clothing shops where there was a changing room where you could go and try anything on that was just not possible and so um a lot of the um saudi women would have things made by tailors but it would be um putting a little image with a piece of fabric and some measurements through a little cubby hole and then coming back you know a couple of weeks later for this finished garment that mm. nobody had managed to fit on you and so the fact that we were able to make bespoke um, garments that fitted people and um, my husband worked for British Aerospace so ex-military and so within the compounds there were quite a lot of events that you know dinners and things that people um, went to and would want beautiful clothes to wear and of course it's lovely weather all the time so um, gorgeous evening dresses and so um, we did that for quite a while and um, yeah we, we were very successful with it and enjoyed it. And in, in addition to that you talk about a chance meeting in 1996 in Saudi Arabia that changed your life. Tell us a story. So um, within the um, compounds, which were very Western, we could have little sales of, of, of crafts that ladies made, that kind of thing. And we would do that um, at certain times of the year. You know, they might be quite seasonal. And uh, one day I was sat next to a lady and I was selling some items at this bazaar. And um, the lady next to me was advertising and selling her quilting classes. And we were sat ne- uh, next to each other um, for six hours. And for six hours, <laughs> she kept saying, oh, you should come on one of my quilting courses. Well, I didn't think I was interested. But after six hours of being worn down by this lady, <laughs> I thought, well, she's never going to shut up unless I say yes to this. So I said, what is the shortest course I can come on? And it was a three morning, um, uh, it was a, a paper piece pineapple quilt, a three mornings. And so I went along and I, just as you all know, you quilters, I absolutely loved it. Um, and then... Um, yeah, the the other designer had left by Saudi by that point, and so I decided that quilting was the direction that I wanted to explore rather than continue to make um, wedding dresses and evening dresses. What was it about quilting that that pulled you in? Uh, I think um, well, one of the I mean, making garments for people is absolutely lovely, and and often you will make something that absolutely transforms people. I mean, I can think of garments that we made that and I think, gosh, that lady looked so beautiful in that. And then you might get a lady who perhaps had gone on holiday to the Far East and she would come back with a really inexpensive piece of silk that, you know, you just looked at it and it wrinkled and she would insist on having some style that didn't suit her body type in this terrible fabric that she was going to give you a fortune to make. And you would just think, actually, you know, if I make quills, I can do whatever I like and nobody's going to. So it was, and and also... uh, Throughout my whole kind of sewing career, and and that includes my quilting career, I've explored an incredible wide range of different styles and techniques. And what I particularly love about this is, you know, I've been sewing for 55 years or more. I never tire of it. There is never a day I don't want to sew. There is never a time I don't learn something new that I'm always like, I've got this idea. How am I going to make it work? And it is the kind of engineering of it that I find tremendously satisfying because I haven't ever kind of come up with an idea and not been able to think of a way to actually practically make that work as a a textile item. What's your favorite quilt that you've ever made? 
Um, well, it was quite a nice little story. But um, so I, I, um, I started quilting in '96, and I did find a quilt group in Saudi. But what I thought quilting was, because I hadn't done it in the UK or been exposed to it, was we went to the meeting every month, and there were some books and magazines and things. And you chose a pattern, and you went away and you made it, and you brought it back and you showed it off the following month, <laughs> which I did. Um, and then a lady that I met, an American uh, lady, said, "You want to go to the States and do a quilting course?" Um, and so. In 1999, I went for the first time to Quilting by the Lake, which was upstate New York, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I just went to do four days. It was, the, it was the summer vacation, so I dropped the kids off from Saudi with my mum in Yorkshire, and then I, I flew to the States just to do four days of classes. But, I mean, I remember going into this um, big gym where there was this huge exhibition of, of all kinds of quilts, and I was just, we would use the term gobsmacked in the UK. Sure. That, that I had no idea what was possible in terms of dyeing and embellishing and texture and so on. And so at that point, I did think, you know, you're a bit of an idiot, aren't you, Philip? You know, you were a trained clothing designer. What are you doing? You should be making your own um, quilts. And a little thing my friends, when I got back to Saudi, said, um, uh, what, what, what was it like? Did you have a nice time? I said, it was better than my honeymoon, but don't tell my husband. <laughs> so, anyway, I uh, uh, the following year, I made a, a quilt for my husband's um, 50th birthday. And um, a friend in Saudi said, you should send this to the American Quilter Society show in Paducah. And I said, it's not going to get in there. She said, why don't you send slides off? Because it was still slides at that point. Um, and it was juried in and it won um, second place in the amateur category, which was $1,000. Now, I sent um, another quilt off the following year um, to the show and, again, didn't get to the show. I'm stuck in Saudi. And this, the second quilt, which was called Pop Stars, won the Benina Workmanship Award happily, sewn on a Benina, um, uh, which was a $12,000 purchase award. And then the following year um, to that, I sent off another quilt and, again, never been to the show. And um, I got a phone call from um, Meredith Schrader, who is um, the owner of... um, the AQS and um, she phoned me up in Saudi Arabia to tell me that I'd won best of show which Mm -hmm. was um, an $18,000 purchase award and so um, that was the second quilt to go into the museum and I I have visited it in the museum several times and I I feel I feel really privileged when I sent it off I had no idea that it would never come back to me so I have very little in the way of photographs or anything like that but when I see it hanging there and I, I, I just can just stand back and listen to people even now so we're 20 years on from making that quilt it's a really nice piece of work I mean I'm surprised that oh did, you, did I really make that <laughs> but, but it's where it should be because what its job is in all of this is to go out and say this person really loves to do this she mm-hmm. wants to show you the joy she gets in making it and she wants you to have a go and get as much fun out of this as I do and it absolutely has done that in spades do you still have those other quilts um if they were returned to you after after you won prizes do you still have those so um, with the American Quilter Society, if you win one of the major awards with the very large amounts of money, it is a purchase award. And so um, you you have a choice. You can have your quilt returned to you and not have the large sum of money, or you can sell your quilt to the museum and it becomes part of their collection. Um, so I have three large pieces in the museum. I believe I'm the only non-American to have more than one. Um, and I would have had my three miniatures in there, um, recent miniature quilts, which would have made a total of six quilts um, but I, I decided not to sell the miniature quilts because they are brilliant teaching tools you know you can pop them in your hand luggage on a flight uh, my kids might actually want them because they're tiny mm-hmm. um, and also they they were the everything that I did in the miniature quilts I had learned in the large pieces and they are very close to my heart I feel like mm-hmm. what so many years of kind of experimentation and 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 work into them that I this is like your children I and mean, people say this it's ridiculous isn't it but I don't want to let them go yet sure and and they're with you until they're not or always will be yeah exactly and and that museum um that you're talking about we've actually um, been down there a couple of times to record this podcast and not only is it an amazing place to, to go visit but the people that run it and have worked with us are just delightful and I would suggest to everybody who is 
sharing this conversation with us. If you get the opportunity to to go to Paducah, uh, please go see that museum. Um, Absolutely. Now, in the beginning, you said, you know, boy, it sounds like I've lived a very full life. Well, you you have. And now I keep saying, and in addition to this, so I'm going to say that one more time. In addition to all of this, you have published two books. Uh, one is called Quilting in the Limelight, which is actually an autobiographical story of life and quilting while you were in Saudi Arabia. And then you wrote Applique Mastery, uh, which is an extensive applique and finishing technique section uh, and also has instructions on how to make your version of your award-winning quilt bird by bird. So I want to talk about these two books. First of all, would you share a story or two from your autobiography? (laughs) Yes, so um, I was... um uh, it was suggested to me that I should um, write a book by a, an American publisher, um, Lady Linda from Dragon Thread. She's since retired, so the business is no longer operational. And um, yeah, it's like all of these things. You've never written a book before, so you don't know what you're going to do. And um, with everything that I think we do, we should only talk about what we know. And, and what I know is my life, isn't it? So I decided that everybody loves a little insight. You know, Instagram's the perfect looking into people's houses and things. You know, we all love to, to see how other people live. So I decided that I would make it the story of my life, but not just my sewing life. Uh, and a big part of that was um, when we left Saudi Arabia after 15 years and the children were 11 and 13, um, my husband said, we cannot just get on a plane and go from one life to a completely different life. Um, And so in our our Land Rover, we drove 10,000 miles from Saudi Arabia back to um, the UK. Oh, my. It took us 10 weeks and we went through Syria and Jordan and um, all of the places that we, it was actually 2004, so it was after September the 11th, so it wasn't without some risk. However, um, people generally just want to get on with their lives and were extremely uh, welcoming, but visited all kinds of places that now it would be almost impossible um, to visit. And um, we took our kids out of school to do that, but it was the most phenomenal experience. And um, the children never, ever once said, um, are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> that they, in itself is a miracle. Yeah, yeah, they just kind of embrace the whole thing and, and have seen things that they may never get the opportunity um, to see again. And then when we finally got back to the UK, the idea was that we would um, spend a year renovating the home that we live in now, which is a Victorian house from 1864 um, and had been quite neglected for 40 or 50 years. Uh, I put my sewing machine away in, I get this right, April um, April 2004, and I didn't get it out again until January 2006, which <laughs> did mm-hmm. really nearly do for me. Um, and so it is the story of, of those things. and. What both my husband and I firmly believe in is that whatever you do, it informs whatever else you do. And so the travels inform the quilting in terms visually, you know, um, uh, you know, wallpapering a wall makes me a better quilter because I know how to do invisible joins, you know, or every skill connects to every other skill. And that's part of what I'm trying to, to show. And, and if a viewers want to look at my um, Instagram, they will see that, you know, I'm there drilling holes and, and you know, doing absolutely everything that, that uh, my feeling is that if you can't maintain your own house in terms of cleaning and fixing it, it's too big for you and you shouldn't be living in it. <laughs> <laughs> Very true words. Um, is there any one or two experiences in your 10,000 mile journey that come to mind? Um, yeah, some that I don't think I can, that I should mention really. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, no, just uh, del- just all really delightful. Um, my youngest son Benjamin at the time w- was eleven and uh, had long blonde hair, and um, so traveling through the Middle East, um, people didn't uh, identify long blonde, and he was a very pretty child, it, definitely a boy, but a very pretty child. Um, didn't identify this with a boy, and so on more than one occasion, we would be in a, a very quiet restaurant in the middle of nowhere, having our lunch or whatever. And a he would want to go to the bathroom, and it would be directed to the ladies' bathroom, mm-hmm. and and very graciously would just go in because there was nobody else about. Um, but also on on more than one occasion, uh, was presented with a red rose as he left the restaurant. 
pounds. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> but if you saw him now, you would. You, yes, he has a shaved head now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, in in your second book, um, you teach uh, how to make a version of your quilt, which is called Bird by Bird. So, my first question when I I saw the name of your quilt was was this named after the book by Anne Lamott? Yes, absolutely. And so um, I had read um, Anne's book oh, a number of years before, and it made a big impression on me. And um, Anne Lamott is a writer, and the book Bird by Bird is about the, the process of writing. But I don't think it's just about the process of writing. You can identify all kinds of, of methods of working, whatever you do creatively. And so mm-hmm. I think it's as applicable to a to a painter as it is to a textile artist and so on. But the reason the book is called Bird by Bird is that her younger brother, her father's also a, a writer, but her younger brother had, I think it was all of the 10 weeks summer vacation to um, write a project on um, Birds of America. I think that's correct. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the Sunday before he starts school again and he has even started this project mm-hmm. and so uh, his dad just says to him is it some of the same she says bird by bird buddy bird by bird <laughs> and Indeed. so it's the whole idea that you don't need the big picture and that the most important thing is just to get started and it's very much how it work you get started and then it evolves and the work tells you what it needs as you go along and I find that kind of not fighting it is um and allowing the work to develop is is works for me and um, but also the the because we have chickens and ducks and we did have a a goose at the time who was called Ryan Gosling I had to get that in there <laughs> um that we're very much about birds in this house and so the whole of the there were many themes that connected and I wrote to um Anne's publisher to ask them if they would contact her um and would she be happy for me to do this and um she very kindly said she was happy so um I was very pleased to have um, even through the publishers have made contact with somebody who had written such a meaningful book. <laughs> it it is a brilliant book, uh, one of my favorites. Um, will you describe the quilt for us? Um, so it is um, it's it's a an applique, um, sorry applique, I should say, sorry, different language there. Um, and so what what the book is about is to teach you as many different um, applique techniques as possible, and then. Um, to give you a project to put some of those techniques actually into action. And so I began making what I thought was going to be a very small quilt for this book to illustrate the techniques, Um, but it just grew into a much larger project. Um, But it also had to be doable for anybody who wanted to take on the challenge. So it is not as complex as a lot of the um, exhibition work that I do, certainly in the machine quilting. Um, But I started by just making um, little motifs of birds and hearts and um, arranging them on a white background and the colouring is is purple and greens and orange little bits of yellow um, and just just get in the middle and then just seeing what I felt it needed as it um, grew out and it so it's mostly turned edge of BK lots of perfect circles it's got swirls in it it's got um, a, a kind of twisted piping that separates the border from the main central section of the quilt and it has a, a wavy edge rather than prairie point so it's very much about um, curves but um, uh, yeah, I always like to start with a strong centre. I generally always make medallion quilts, generally always in a square format. Strong centre, a little bit softer, and then a strong finish. That's a kind of formula that I seem to stick to, whether I like it or not. And and this quilt, once again, is in your book, Applique Mastery. And your first book is called Quilting in the Limelight. Uh, and uh, for those sharing this conversation, both books, uh, you would want to to take a look at. So I, I want to go to 1929 now. You and your business partner, David Tonjman, began Quilter's Question Time. Before we talk about that, though, how did you and David meet and how did you become business partners? So um, David is the uh, husband of a friend of mine, Stephanie, and we have a mutual friend, another lady called Tony, who um, was always a uh, 
wonderful at hosting great parties with with music and poetry and all kinds of things. So that's where I, I originally met David and Stephanie. And over a number of years, um, David's listening on the other side of the room, by the way, he's chuckling. Um, <laughs> David, um, David kept chatting to me when we would periodically be at these things, saying, you know, we, we, we could do a few video classes and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be very much. Anyway, 2019, when we... we um, we began, I had had an, in, uh, up until that day after leaving Saudi, a really intensive traveling and teaching program that would see me on the road for four or five months of the year or more, and then working, writing books and so on in my studio. And I decided that in 2019, I would take a year off and not do any traveling. Now that didn't actually happen because I'm very bad at saying no, but I did have less traveling than I normally had. And so I said to, to David, I said, well, if we're going to do it, this is the year that we need to do it. And David said, oh, but just a couple of days a, a month. And it won't, it's just the classes that you're already teaching. It won't be lots mm-hmm. of prep. Um, anyway, it, it, it absolutely snowballed and we were already set up when COVID hit in 2020, where lots of people were um, suddenly unable to teach. We had already been offering our carefully uh, filmed and edited classes um, for over a year before that point. And so we were just phenomenally busy, uh, more so then than now, but we continue to be hugely busy. And um, it has become more than a full-time job and we are both amazed i'm looking at david he's nodding um, amazed at the success and uh, what mm-hmm. the incredible kind of positivity of it so not only do we um uh, release classes and our, our um subscribers have access to them they don't ever lose their access to they can watch them as often as they like for as long as we have a business but we have um, a facebook group we have a lovely lady kelly who looks after our facebook group and so there's a whole community there um, and once a month um, not only for our, our quilting but our garment making we do live question and answer sessions we let people know this and questions in um People can watch them live. They're taped. They are just so much fun, and we we feel that we we absolutely have this amazing group of people that get to know each other through all of these different things, and that you know most of our ladies, and they are mostly ladies, are sixty, seventies, and even older, and we do become a little bit invisible and. Particularly, I think, with the garment making, people that haven't made clothes for a long time, there's a lot of emphasis on fit and really helping me, people make clothes that um, they actually are going to wear. And just to see them blossom and show the pictures of what they've made and everybody's just so incredibly supportive. It, it is so much more than the sum of its parts. It, it, it's absolutely, I mean, I, you know, I'm 62. I, I am going to, I don't ever think I will retire in that sense, but what a fantastic thing to come to at this stage in my working career. It, it really is. I mean, I, it, David, David holds all the credit for pushing me into doing it, really. <laughs> um, how many members um, uh, join you? Oh, we have we have a good few thousand. <laughs> oh my! And and I'm assuming this is uh, international. Yeah. So um, the the majority is interesting actually because our quilting and um, our quilting is pretty much split roughly 50-50 between America and the UK, but we actually have members from 26 different countries, um, but some countries will only have one or two members, quite a lot of Australians and New Zealand because of the language, but all of our classes are um, subtitled, so you do have that. But interestingly, with the garment making, about 90% of the garment makers are um, British and only 10% American, so it's a very different um, split, and there, there are a lot more quilters than there are garment makers. You know, um, on, on this this podcast, we've had people talking about similar groups to this where they, they get together to, to sew and quilt, and then the community becomes so much more. Um, women, and, and you were talking about the invisibility of uh, people in their 60s, and it seems like in, in many of these groups, um, it, the, the relationship transcends just what you're there to do with sewing. Uh, women have helped each other through uh, health crises and family crises and, and job issues. Do you find that that happens with your group as well? Absolutely. Um, what, what I think these, I mean, they're, they're incredibly valuable 
incredibly valuable artistically and creatively, but they are the support groups for women. You know, mm-hmm. I think that women, I don't want to say that women have a hard time, but women have a lot of responsibilities in caring for, you know, firstly children and families and then elderly um, relatives and things. And so women, women just often get, on with it and don't have an an outlet and all you really need is somebody just to understand really don't you you know Mm -hmm. that because they 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 are going through or have gone through or will go through the similar things themselves and so i i i think they are invaluable in that sense they offer so much more than just the creative side and and it is a thing that david always said you know they'll come for the classes they stay for the community and it, it that's the, about the truest thing he's ever ever really said um so yes i mean it, it is just amazing to see the just the confidence and the blossoming and people that you know never worn a flower dress you know not worn a flower dress a big print for 40 years and suddenly they're getting compliments left right and center mm-hmm. for this amazing dress that they've had the courage to make and wear so yeah fantastic on every level i'm going to quote you here now you have said once you have a machine of good quality it's not about the machine but about what you are prepared to do with it There's no magic to any of this. Anyone who gets quite good at anything does so by lots and lots of practice. Persistence is the key. Tell us more about this. Yeah, so I absolutely believe that. And um, as you know, I started sewing from being very, very tiny, you know, four, five, six. I'd be doing tiny little bits of sewing. And there isn't a day goes by when I don't want to sew. Um, I I. I don't actually believe in talent. I think that you may have certain um, physical and mental attributes that may assist you, but there are plenty of, in inverted brackets, talented people out there who haven't achieved anything. And I do think that it is about doing it and doing it and doing it, and that it does not matter what the, the task is. If you practice it, and really put your heart into it and really want to do it, you will do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't think that I could get, if I was to start sewing now, I don't think I could get to the standard that I am now at simply because I don't have enough years to do that. But what I, what I sometimes think people want to believe is that it is about talent because it almost gives them the pers- permission not to do it if you're with me mm-hmm. okay uh, and so what is what i my whole focus with my students is not to make them a replica of me in terms of what they're making i i don't particularly want to teach projects although i do teach some projects i'm about teaching them skills and giving them the competence and the position permission in that sense. I always say there are no rules. There are no rules. You do whatever you want. If it works for you and you're having fun, then you've Mm -hmm. succeeded. If you're not enjoying it, it's pointless. Don't don't listen to the rules. And so what what I want to encourage them is that it's all possible. And if they really want to do it, they absolutely can do it. So that that is my that is my absolute belief. In addition to your sewing, you renovated a house. You also love the garden. There's some lovely pictures of your flowers on your website. What is it about gardening that you enjoy so much? I think that I spent 15 years inside in air conditioning in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and I cannot wait to get outside. I, mm-hmm. I, I need to be outside. Um, I think, you know, um, we have a, a nice climate here. So even though we are miserable in the winter, we, there's not a lot of time when you can't be outside if you want to. And it is beautifully green, particularly this year. We've had a lot of rain. Mm-hmm. Um, but having the, having the ducks and um, the chickens is not, just about um uh, the eggs it makes you go outside every day because you've got to go and care for them and just to having to go outside every day i think makes you feel um better um my husband actually um just it took three years to do but he's made me the most amazing custom built greenhouse which is huge by british standards anyway and um it's all um custom made brackets and things all based on my bird by bird quilt so all the brackets on the inside are are little birds and hearts and things and uh, it's just the most delightful space so how could you 
not want to be in it. I, I, this this uh, summer, I I have been bringing in over two pounds of tomatoes from my greenhouse day day after day after day after day. <laughs> it it sounds like the the typical tomato harvest. Now, will you be coming to the states anytime soon? Um, so I don't actually have any plans, and I have been asked this question a lot um, recently. I, I first taught in the States in 2004, and I was invited um, to teach at the American Quilter Society show, and it was actually Libby Lehman, who many um, of your listeners will remember, who had had judged my Best of Show quilt the year before, and I said, we, we should get this lady to come. So I'm eternally grateful to her for actually setting me on the path of, of teaching internationally. Um, and so I, I would come every year, two or three times a year, um, up until COVID, obviously. And then uh, last year, I did go back to teach in Houston. I taught there um, every year for 16 years consecutively. Um, but there are a, a good number of reasons why I'm not traveling at the moment. And I will just list some of them. So A, we're Unbelievably busy here at Quilters Question Time and Garment Makers Question Time. So that is a lot of work. Um, my um, my mum died recently. My father had a seizure and can't drive, so I'm caring for him. My uncle uh, needs a lot of help. He has no family. Um, I think that in terms of just long distance flights is not something I feel that I want to be doing. I'm very interested mm-hmm. in the environment. Um, and so that is a positive difference that I feel I can make. I know it's only one person. Um, and just, just I traveled for so much and I slept in so many different beds and ate so much food that I didn't want to eat. <laughs> I need to stay home and eat the tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the eggs that, yeah. that you get. Yeah. So so for for the short term at least, we'll just have to meet you and enjoy your presence online. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So with all of this, what's next for you? What's your dream? Oh, uh, I did actually read that and think I don't know what to say to that, really. Um, I don't, in that sense, have many dreams or need to accomplish lots of things because I already feel like I've accomplished a great deal. I would, I would kind of say, you know, if I die now, I'll be really happy with what went before and there's nothing mm-hmm. that I would change on any of that. So I think it is just more of the same. I mean, I, I always have endless plans of, of things to do. Um, we Our house is a, is a three-story house and the the ground floor is a separate flat, which until two or three years ago had belonged to somebody else, but we now own that and we are going to renovate that. So um, we're busy with an architect finalizing plans. There'll be lots of hands-on work with that. The garden is a never, ever evolving thing. I I want to sew as much as I possibly can. All of the listeners will understand that you have so many stitch ideas in your head, you're never going to accomplish them Um you know, in a in a lifetime. So, uh, David always sort of says we finish filming for the for a week. We film usually over a week. Uh, a day's filming usually equates to an hour's um, worth of class. So, a three, four, five hour class will take a week to just to film without all the editing. But as soon as we finished and we were packed up, my head is thinking, right, what can I do now? <laughs> And I'm immediately <laughs> on to the next thing. And, and I just think, you are here once. You have to do it, you know, and pack it in. And, and we, we were actually were, uh, were filming most of last week and hope to finish later on today. And already I'm thinking, what can I do tonight? <laughs> you, you don't sit still long. No, at not all. too much. <laughs> so, so we've covered so much ground today and you've shared a lot of your story with us. Is there any question I didn't ask that you wish I had? can't think of anything i mean i i i um listened to lots of the previous episodes and thought you did an absolutely wonderful job and um uh it was all very interesting so my hope is that all of the listeners will think what we have chatted about today um was an entertaining half an hour or more and um yeah uh yeah just keep follow me on instagram and just see where we end up next <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us to celebrate our 70th episode. I also know that our listeners would love to reach out to you. I'm sure they have questions or would like to know more. What's the best way for them to do that? Okay, so um, they can find out all about the classes through um, Quilters Question Time and Garment Makers Question Time. There's lots of information there. And can I just say on 
Garment Makers Question Time. There's a thing called Philippa's Foundations and there's loads of free content on all kinds of things like sew machine settings and different fabrics and threads and things that anybody can access. So uh, I, if they want to kind of know a little bit more about how I work and how I teach, they can certainly find that there. Um, and then um, my personal website, which is philippanaylor.com, there is a, um, a, a link there where you can send me an email um, through that. Um, can I just say now, as I know this is going to result in a lot of questions. Both of the books are out of print and there are no copies. I have none for sale and they're not going to be reprinted. But they do come up from time to time lurking on the shelves in the back of a a quilt store or on eBay or other things. So um, my suggestion is don't ask me for a book, just keep looking out there. (laughs) Or perhaps libraries would would have a copy. Yes, Mm -hmm. good idea. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure and I've been smiling from start to finish. And uh, we have a program in the UK called Desert Island Disc. And this is the equivalent of um, the Quilt Makers Desert Island Disc. And it is the epitome of everybody's career to be asked to be on that. So uh, I've reached a real high point with you today. Thank you, Meg. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you. Someone for whom sewing and quilting is so much more than a hobby, it's a way of life and a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to meg at soandsopodcast.com or just complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to, review, and rate this podcast on your favorite platform. Visit our website, soandsopodcast.com, for more information on today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So and So. So.